somewhere on the wind-blown plains of Middle America, there stands a home. It's a regular, unassuming home. Nothing in its appearance draws your attention, nor marks it out as any different from the others. But this home once held a dark secret, one that would remain hidden for the most part. At least, until today. You see, once upon a time, not all that long ago actually, this was my home. I was among a small number of young men. We resided in the dark depths of the home's basement, five in total. We existed there not by choice, but by decree. Our days were consumed with work, while our nights were spent in dreaming. Among those dreams, we often entertained the idea of freedom. Fortunately for myself and the others, one brave member of our community would make these dreams a reality. She's the reason I'm able to share my story with you today. I suppose I'll start with the larger aspects of the tale before focusing on myself. Of course, no real names or locations will be used for the sake of privacy. It all began way before I was actually born, around the mid-1960s or so. A young charismatic preacher built a dedicated group around him. His theology was different from most in the faith. According to his teachings, Mary Magdalene was given the power to speak the word of God by Jesus himself. Upon his ascent to heaven, Mary effectively became the head of the Christian church. Through generations, this line was passed down into our Holy Father, who traced himself back to Mary Magdalene herself. This idea was surprisingly well received at the time. By 1980, they'd amassed a congregation of over 3,500. However, as times changed, more and more devotees left the church for a number of different reasons. When I was born in 1993, our group had dwindled to a paltry 125 members. A few years earlier, this church had purchased a small piece of land in the upper area of the Midwest. All the buildings were built by hand by the congregation. Everyone was required to live on this compound, and all labor was evenly divided amongst the members. It was very similar to the communes popular in the 1960s and 70s. I can only assume our church was built around the same model. I'm leaving out quite a bit, but I just wanted to give you the general idea. The community was very similar to the agrarian lifestyles of centuries past, and most all work was done by hand. It wasn't like in my time machines were shunned or anything. Many people just took pride in doing them on their own, no matter the hardship. That was the type of environment I grew up in. I'll take a few moments to explain what led to us living in a basement. From the start, females enjoyed an exalted position in our particular faith. They served as apostles and teachers to the young and newer members. Other than our leader himself, no other man held any position of power. This was just an accepted part of life, really, and rarely ever questioned. A male had to be married to even remain in or join the congregation. In later years, our leader even put a severe restriction on new marriages. Therefore, the younger men, unable to find a partner, or simply uninterested in marrying, would be excommunicated after reaching the age of 21. Nearing the end of that time, we became little more than beasts of burden, strong hands for the fields and other things. The biggest change, though, came in 1998. The Holy Father decreed that all males must be sent to live in the youth dorm at the time of puberty, for propriety's sake. This was a basement that he'd termed the youth dorm, but we all knew it was just a regular old musty, mold-filled basement. This pronouncement only served to further fracture our already ailing group. Unfortunately for me though, my parents were true diehards. We remained along with the very last of the devotees, so when my time came at 13 years old, I couldn't do anything. I had to take my place in the basement. Although the adjustment period was very difficult, a strong bond soon formed with my fellow prisoners, at least as I put it. From dawn till dusk, we were worked ragged, our only respite coming on Sundays, in which we spent the mornings in holy services. The remainder of the day was our own. 
However, those that didn't volunteer to do additional work were required to remain locked in the basement. While far more terrible things would be suffered by us during our time there, I'm still unfortunately unable to discuss them. I think it's better they stay buried, honestly. Out of nowhere, in 2010, an unlikely individual would change everything, though. Ruth was just another congregate, but by advantage of being born a woman in our group, she held a leadership position. Although not lofty by any means, it was a substantial amount of power due to the dwindling group at our time. Unknown to anyone else inside the group, she'd been building a body of information implicating our Holy Father in multiple crimes. On several visits into town, she met up with law enforcement and their colleagues in the district attorney's office. They seemed especially interested in the treatment of males in the church. Luckily, he'd also been cheating on his taxes as well, the crime he was ultimately imprisoned for. When the day came that Ruth turned over all the documents to authorities, that church ceased to exist. A judge ruled our treatment to be inhumane and immoral, and we left the basement for the final time later that week. Everything else was handled quietly behind closed doors as to prevent embarrassment to the local community. When I was finally able to speak to Ruth face to face, I asked her why she'd done it. She said our treatment within the congregation had always bothered her, her father's in particular. Just a year prior, she had begun a secret relationship with one of the young men locked in the basement. She knew they would likely not be allowed to marry as long as things continued as they did. The last straw was what she discovered while digging, though. The extent of the Holy Father's corruption sickened her. Her initial intent had not been to destroy our group but she realized he was inextricably woven into it. I greatly admired her, and any person willing to sacrifice everything for those they love. She managed to build a respectable and happy life outside the church. My wife and I named our first daughter Ruth as a sign of respect for her. To close things out, I want to share the fate of my fellow dorm mates as well. It seems that our horrible experiences did not have any noticeable long-term side effects. All of us are now married with families. Mark, my closest friend from the church, has been with his partner for quite some time after. It's a story with many dark aspects, and I'd like to end it with a positive message. I know many of us have suffered terrible things in our lives. A great deal of us may still be suffering. Rather than my story being one of sadness, though, I prefer to view it as one of hope. I want you to make note of this. No matter how dark things may seem at the moment, better things may be waiting just around the corner. When the headlines screamed local man tortured in basement, I was naturally curious. Little did I know that I would be in the same position not even a week later. According to the story in the paper, a group of home invaders had burst into a nearby jewel dealer's home to steal a stash of diamonds he was rumored to have on site. Having caught the dealer unawares, they demanded to know the location of said stash. The dealer, as it would turn out, truthfully told the gang that no such thing existed. The only thing he did have was an empty safe in his bedroom closet. Of course, this revelation did not make the group very happy. They chose to disbelieve the homeowner, and for the next hour or so, the burglars took turns torturing him for the location of this non-existent stash. It would only be the arrival of a nosy neighbor that would cause the thieves to scatter, but by this point, the homeowner was mere minutes away from death had he not been so swiftly rushed to the hospital. A harrowing story to be sure, but never once had I ever thought that I would have anything to do with it. The extent of my riches amassed was only about 25 grand or so. It consisted of a 19th century gold and silver coin collection my father had left me. I just had the collection appraised the year before, probably why I was chosen as a target. The appraiser at the time had offered me 10,000 for it, but I politely declined. The coins sat collecting dust in my floor-side safe. After that week or more went by, 
I was loafing on my couch watching a movie, about 2 p.m. on a Saturday, I believe, when suddenly a loud crashing came from my front door. I was so focused on the television in that moment, I nearly jumped out of my skin. I peeked around the corner just in time to see three masked figures pouring in one by one through my recently shattered door. They were surrounding me, guns raised. Within a few seconds, I was told to get down on my knees, and naturally I did so. My heart was pounding, and my mouth was bone dry. Instead of shooting me though, one of them demanded I give him the combination to my safe. This was the moment I realized who I was dealing with. I tried to play dumb. There's no safe. Do I look like a guy that would have a safe? I said. I know my ability to lie is usually better, but I wasn't exactly prepared for the situation. The shortest of the group gave me a quick attitude correction with the barrel of his pistol. Still, I could not tell. My pride and love for my father prevented me from doing so. I wouldn't be caught dead letting some thugs steal his life's work. Had I been more clear-headed and given more time to think things over, perhaps I would have chosen a wiser path. To their credit, I was given plenty of opportunity to concede, but once they had me tied up in the basement, they were all business. Even as they tightened the knots and applied the gag, I was convinced it was simply a fear tactic. Surely after what had happened before, they wouldn't repeat the same mistake. But by God was I wrong. Right out the gate, one of them smashed my left hand with a hammer. The pain was unimaginable. My right hand was next. It was even worse, if that's possible. I was ready to tell them anything at that point, but I'd angered them, and they simply wanted to make me pay for that. My feet were next, then my knees. I was barely even conscious. Only then was I permitted to speak. While one guy went upstairs, the remaining two huddled in the corner talking. I could imagine my fate was being discussed. I never saw their faces. There was no reason to add murder to their list of crimes, I thought. I knew this instinctively, but I was convinced I'd not live to see the morning. The next few hours were hazy. All the adrenaline had worn off, and the pain was coming in waves so severe I passed out more than once. In the moment, it seemed death would have been more preferable, but due to some fortune, I stayed alive. I can't exactly tell you when that gang left. I wouldn't have known how long I spent tied up had my son not told me so later. Yes, my son's stubbornness was my savior. After multiple unanswered calls, he began to believe I was dodging him. The young man drove 45 miles one way just to give me an earful. I thought I was dreaming. His voice echoed down the basement stairs, and I thought I was having a death hallucination. The paramedics moving me finally woke me up, though. For a split second, I actually believed them to be my captors. Their faces were bare, so I was sure death was coming, but my son calmly placed his hands on my shoulders and assured me everything was all right. It's probably clear what followed next. My time in the hospital extended a long period with multiple surgeries, and the recovery after was spent in various casts, even a period of time in a wheelchair. For the most part, I managed to completely heal. The cold and damp are a chore now, but since I moved south, I rarely experienced that sort of pain. As sad as this may sound, I harbor no lasting hatred of those thieves. They may have taken something valuable, but they gave me a much more important thing back, my life and my relationship with my son. Nonetheless, when I was notified of their arrest seven months later, I was overjoyed. Only a small amount of the collection was reclaimed, most being sold long ago. Honestly, I was surprised to get any of it back at all. Presently, all of these gentlemen are a guest of the correctional system, likely for the next 30 years or more. I briefly returned to work after my recovery, but I subsequently had to retire soon after. The majority of my days are now spent in leisurely pursuits, like fishing and hunting, I learned an important lesson in that moment all those years ago. Life is a special and fleeting thing, and you should enjoy every day like it's your last. I'd gladly sacrifice a million coin collections for another day with those I love.
When we're kids, we don't always listen to the adults around us. Part of growing up requires us to push on boundaries, or we'd never know when we go too far. It's just a fact of life. Adults already know this, and they try their best to let us learn on our own. Even then though, they wouldn't hesitate to put their foot down in the best interest of your safety. I know this now, and I did the same with my kids when they were young. However, there was a time when you couldn't tell me anything. I constantly pushed those boundaries and never learned from my mistakes. That is, until I almost died in my youth. I was very much a handful, too much for my mother in fact. My dad had been shot down and killed in Vietnam when I was only two years old. My mother didn't date after, and both my grandfathers had also passed away. I lacked any male role models in my life. My mom tried to teach me, but she just couldn't do a very good job filling this role. This was another time, mind you, and my mom was just a small town, simple lady. I was old enough to know she was overworked and not exactly the assertive type. Naturally, I exploited this. I had not yet fallen into crime, but she feared that I soon would. She searched out a solution to my behavioral problems, and soon came up with what seemed to be a perfect one. Spring break would soon arrive, and she would need someone to look after me during the day. This is when Dad's mother, Granny Jean, came into the picture. Mom and Granny Jean never saw eye to eye, but they kept things very civil. I'd soon discover Granny Jean seemed to be just what I needed. She'd grown up during the Depression, and that made her a tough, no-nonsense type of woman. She had no time for foolishness, but was capable of showing genuine love and kindness whenever appropriate. The two spoke on the phone, and she agreed to take me in for the week. I left for the farm on that Sunday morning, and arrived by bus later that day. A daunting trip for a lone nine-year-old. Not that I would have admitted it to anyone. Granny Jean picked me up at the station and we drove the 25 miles back to the farm in silence. I say in silence, but there was a preacher talking on the radio for most of the ride. I tried to speak up once until I got the stink eye from old granny, then figured I'd be better off just not talking. Not until breakfast the following morning, actually, did she ever truly talk to me. Afterwards, I received a quick lesson in feeding the animals, and then I was left to entertain myself. Naturally, I took off in search of trouble. Most of the day was spent walking the fields and exploring these woods. I returned briefly for lunch, then renewed my explorations. Around four o'clock or so, I came across an old abandoned farmhouse. A massive thing, two stories with a big wraparound porch. I just couldn't resist. I quickly looked through the windows to make sure no one was inside. Seeing nobody, I walked around back and entered. There wasn't much to see, but to me this was like a giant clubhouse. It was getting quite late, so I left with the intention of returning. That evening at dinner, I happened to make mention of that old abandoned house. No sooner than I said it though, Granny Jean jumped down my throat. That's not your property. Don't you go back there. It's old and dangerous. It's not safe. You understand me? I was terrified by her sudden reaction and sheepishly said, yes ma'am. I was shocked at my own sheepishness. I would not been in the habit of respecting my elders, but she was in full control, and she knew it well. Well, almost full control. That night, as I lay in bed, all I could think about was that old house I'd found. There was still so much to explore. I had to go back, and so I did the next morning, stealing a flashlight on my way out. Beginning where I'd left off the day prior, I climbed the creaky stairs to the second floor. Had I been smarter about the layout of old houses, I would have tried to explore the attic, but I didn't realize it was there at the time. I did encounter a door that likely led to it, but it was locked so I moved on. I still had much more to see. Having found nothing of note at this point though, I returned to the kitchen. A door I hadn't tried yet was located there. It was extremely difficult to open, but after a few hard yanks it broke free. Ahead of me were these dark stairs, leading into a basement. The darkness before me beckoned me down into it. With my borrowed flashlight in hand, 
I descended those old stairs. One step had long since rotten away, and I jumped. It was a miracle the step I landed on didn't snap as well. Eventually reaching the bottom, I swept this large room with the beam of light. I couldn't see much from my position, therefore I made the mistake of taking a closer look. I took two, maybe three steps, when the door above me suddenly slammed shut behind me. I'm not sure what caused it to close. A gust of wind was the most likely guess. But I was almost positive that as soon as I'd started going down the stairs, I'd already closed the door behind me. I mean, I could have been wrong, I guess. I was never good about closing doors. So no matter how improbable, it was still a possibility. I didn't want to spook myself out with any outlandish theories. I drilled back up the stairs, skipping two or three at a time. I threw myself against the old door, but it wouldn't budge. Again and again I did this, but to no avail. I was completely trapped. I began to panic. Then, suddenly I remembered the big swinging doors I'd seen when I arrived. Frantically racing back down, jumping steps in pairs, a second to last broke under my weight, sending me tumbling across the floor. The room was now complete darkness. I realized my flashlight wasn't working. I shook it rapidly and banged it against things, and it would flicker back to life briefly over and over again. I returned to my feet and renewed my sprint to freedom. The doors were two heavy wooden things that opened out. I needed a lot of power to budge them. I summoned all my strength and threw my body against them, but nothing. I repeated this twice more, until I was too tired to continue. I took a break and tried to think. I closed my eyes and concentrated intensely. I tried to picture the doors outside as I'd seen them the day before. My mind's eye scanned every inch, every nail, every single board, and all the hope I had disappeared in an instant. I remembered a large board straddling the doors from the outside, a sturdy 2x4 or something of similar size, spanning the entire breadth of the opening, slightly under four metal braces. I wandered back and forth around the room examining every square inch in the little light I could receive. There were a couple of small windows, it seemed. Perhaps if I broke those, I could squeeze out. A nearby brick was put into use, but it simply bounced off the panes. I found out later it was reinforced stormproof glass. No matter the amount of foolish optimism I embodied, as the hours passed by, my courage began to fail me. Things wouldn't truly begin to suck until the night came, though. Although the days had always been somewhat warm, the night dipped below freezing. As the sun set down, the basement became colder and colder. To make things even worse, just after 11 p.m. or so, the flashlight gave out completely, shaking it no longer worked. With no moonlight, it was now completely pitch black. Rats began to scatter all around me, and now I was at the lowest point in my young life. My surroundings terrified me more than the thought of freezing to death. Visions of rats gnawing on my limbs, being too weak to move, overwhelmed me. Sleep became harder and harder to avoid. I knew though that if I did fall asleep, I might not ever wake up again. I had no doubt that help would be coming sometime, but would they reach me before I froze? Or even worse, was eaten by rats? Sometime in the early hours of the next morning, I lost the battle and slipped into unconsciousness. In that sleep world, I could almost feel my soul being carried upward. I was no longer shivering. My body was now suddenly warm, and it was no longer painful either. I thought to myself that I was going to heaven. I awoke the next morning, but rather than heaven, I was back in bed. The smell of baked things floated up from the kitchen, and it was all very disorienting. Had I simply dreamed everything? I looked around and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. The sun was shining through the white lace curtains. Granny Jean's cat was curled up in the chair watching me. I was wearing my favorite flannel pajamas and all seemed well. But just below the surface, something bothered me. I slipped quietly into my robes. As I stepped down the stairs, the rotten stairs of that basement flashed in my mind. Maybe I was in hell or something a proper punishment for an unruly child like myself. I expected to be swarmed by a horde of rats at any moment. The cat ran ahead of me and turned the corner. I braced for the gruesome onslaught, but it never came. 
Looking to the left, I could see Granny Jean, her back to me. She sat down at the kitchen table. I stood and watched for a long time, feeling a tug of tension lurking just below the surface. A few minutes passed and Granny Jean turned to me, kindly wishing me a good morning. Are you hungry? Yeah, I answered with a quick jerk. I stood still and watched as she gathered the food. I don't think we need to discuss what happened last night. You're safe now, and I'm sure even a boy as stubborn as you learned his lesson. The relief was indescribable. I fought back tears, but a few escaped, the warmth now even more soothing. I didn't want her to see me crying, so I turned my back to her and spoke. No, ma'am, I've seen now just how difficult I've been. I'm sorry. And that was it. Granny Jean plated up my breakfast, and we sat together as I ate not speaking. The remainder of my visit, I stayed pretty close to the farm. I had meant every word I said that morning. It was like a veil had been lifted. All the trouble I'd caused was revealed to me. The adults around me only had the best in mind for me. Yet all I ever heard in my youthful mind was no. It was like the old version of myself did die that night. When the week came to an end, Granny Jean drove me back to the bus station. As we parted, she gave me a kiss on my cheek. I'd never felt so grateful in my life. I still hold a very special place in my heart for her. This happened in the mid-60s. My family and I lived on a dead-end gravel road, without any streetlights whatsoever. It must have been in the summertime because I remember the door being wide open, with only the screen door closed to let the air in. It was after dark, and the whole family was in the living room watching TV together. The whole family being both of my parents, my two other siblings, and I. My attention was soon taken away from the TV show, however, when I heard the sound of a car slowly coming down the road. Soon after... I heard a woman inside, screaming the most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard, either before or since. I don't think any of us decided to get up and look out the door. We just rushed there and were already looking in no time flat. The car slowly turned around and was parked facing down the road the exact way it had come. No lights on inside or out, not even the headlights. It seemed to be some sort of older model car. The woman's screaming just went on and on. My heart was pounding, and I couldn't catch my breath. Finally, my mother moved first, and turned on the porch light. As soon as the person in the vehicle saw the light turn on, the car started to slowly drive off down the road. The woman began to scream for help, as the car continued to drive out of sight. At this point, my mother shut off the front porch light, and everyone went back to their places and sat down, like nothing ever happened. No one said anything. No one did anything. I couldn't believe that my parents weren't going to do anything about this. No one ever spoke of that incident ever again. And that's the creepiest thing about that night, honestly. Not the spooky car at night with the woman screaming for help, but the fact that my zombie-like parents had no reaction to that nightmare occurring in their front drive, and they didn't do anything about it either.